uh, it, it really does bring joy to my heart, seriously. I had mentioned this before, but um, usually when you want to have a good time, you don't say, let's study the catechism. <laughs> So it's great to see that you have an interest in it, and uh, hopefully, hopefully to this point you've been able to grow in your faith as well. This is something that, that Father Mike br brings out very often as well. This should not just be information, but it should be a source of transformation to grow more fully into those people that God has created us to be and to rejoice more fully in the presence of the Lord so let's just, with that in mind, let's just take a moment of, of quiet, quiet, and I'll start with a reading from Psalm 51. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Have mercy on me, God, in your goodness. In your abundant compassion, blot out my offense. Wash me. Wash away all my guilt. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my offense. My sin is always before me. Against you alone have I sinned. I have done such evil in your sight that you are just in your sentence, blameless when you condemn. Truly I was born guilty, a sinner, even as my mother conceived me. Still you insist on sincerity of heart, in my inmost being, teach me wisdom. Cleanse me that I may be pure. Wash me, make me whiter than snow. Let me hear joy, sounds of joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn away your face from my sin. Blot out all my guilt. A clean heart create for me, O God. Renew in me a steadfast spirit. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us today as we continue to grow in our faith. We ask you, Lord, to, to be with us and guide us in our walk with you so that we may open our hearts and our lives more fully to your presence. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Again, good morning. As you can see, uh, this week we continued looking at sin, but we finally are getting to the redemption piece as well. Finally getting to uh, look at, at Jesus and his role in, in our lives. So let's just again go through the, the outline of what we've looked at. Look at the in brief and then get into uh, some of the questions. Again, we were looking at original sin. This is something that I would like to to try to focus with you a little bit t today because that's something that I think is very important to understand the brokenness and the relationship <clears throat> that we have with a God who wants to be in intimate relationship with us and the depth to which God then goes to cure that brokenness and to reconcile us with him. So we start with, the, uh, we continue with original sin, freedom put to the test, man's first sin, the consequences of sin, Adam's sin for humanity, a hard battle, and then I think the good news, you did not abandon him to the domain of death. So let's take a look at the in brief section here, in paragraph 413 through uh, 421. God did not make death, and he does not delight in the death of the living. It was through the devil's envy that death entered the world. Satan or the devil and the other demons are fallen angels who have freely refused to serve God and his plan. Their choice against God is definitive. They try to associate man in their revolt against God. Although set by God in a state of rectitude, man, enticed by the evil one, abused his freedom at the very start of history. He lifted himself up against God and sought to attain his goal apart from him. By his sin, Adam, as the first man, lost the original holiness and justice he had received from God. 
not only for himself, but for all human beings. Adam and Eve transmitted to their descendants human nature wounded by their own first sin, and hence deprived of original holiness and justice. The dep this deprivation is called original sin. As a result of original sin, human nature is weakened in its powers, subject to ignorance, suffering, and the dominion of death, and inclined to sin. This inclination is called concupiscence. We therefore hold with the Council of Trent that original sin is transmitted with human nature by propagation, not by imitation, and that is proper to each. The victory that Christ won over sin has given us greater blessings than those which sin has taken away from us. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Christians believe that the world has been established and kept in being by the Creator's love, has fallen into slavery to sin, but has been set free by Christ, crucified, and risen to break the power of the evil one. Evil never has the final word. The love and the redemption that's found in Christ is the final word. So before we go on, because we're then moving, believe it or not, we're moving from sin to redemption, uh, moving from a concentration of, of sin. Uh, this is the end of the, uh, the first chapter. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. And we've, we've been spending the last few weeks just looking at that and the implications of that, that overflowing of God's goodness into creation and the creation of the angels, the creation of the earth, the creation of humanity, all flowing from the Father, who in concert with the Son and the Holy Spirit is the creative force of everything. So before we continue, do you have any specific questions on this section? I have a couple of questions that I received here that we'll look into, but anything before we go forward? Yes. Wait, wait a minute, the, we need the microphone turned on here. Okay, perhaps you can, I'll, I'll repeat it. Why don't you just tell me and I'll repeat it. Oh, you don't have to speak into that. <laughs> oh, okay. I always thought, ever since I was a child, I guess, that original sin was taken away with baptism, and then after that it's concupiscence. Is that right or wrong? Yeah, we are cleansed of original sin, but we still have the effects of that sin that continue, and that's the, the effect okay. of that sin is concupiscence. Thank you. We can look into it. I think we're going to get into that if we have time. Any other questions? Okay, then we continue to uh, chapter 2, I believe, in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Keep in mind here that we're using the Apostles' Creed as the uh, form of our outline, if you will. So I believe in God, the Father Almighty, is the beginning. And then we move to uh, chapter 2, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son. Then after that, we'll look into chapter 3, which would be the Holy Spirit, so when we get to this uh, day 40, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, we're going to be focusing just on that, that section of the creed. The good news, God has sent his son to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ at the heart of catechesis, Christ. The catechesis then is the teaching, teaching of the faith. The heart of the teaching of the faith is Christ. So Article 2, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Uh, yesterday we looked at, or Father Mike focused on the name Jesus, God saves, and what that means for us. I, I was particularly touched by his presentation there because he, he's very right. Sometimes we, we take that name for granted and we sort of use it 
too often, and I've heard it used many times, even on TV, as a swear word or a cuss word. And there is no other name besides the name of Jesus through which we will be saved. This is the name, the holy name. It would be similar, I think, to uh, Yahweh. Uh, the, the Jewish appreciation for that is so reverent that you don't even speak it. It's only spoken once a year in the old temple worship, just once a year, and only by one person in the Holy of Holies. It was that holy. And yet we sort of banty this, this uh, around too much. Uh, what happened with our projection here, Abraham? Let me see if I can reset this. I think it was a tornado that came through. <laughs> there we go. Is everybody safe from, from yesterday? That was really kind of scary, I think, for, for a while. Of course, uh, Father Zach was out walking around in the backyard saying, look at this. I said, well, why don't you just hold up pieces of tinfoil when you're out there? I mean, but it was an interesting experience. So anyway, we're looking at, at, at Jesus and, and the importance of that name. And then today, again, uh, we move to the, the name of Christ. And as uh, Father uh, Mike pointed out, this is the fullness of the mission, priest, prophet, and king of the Messiah, the anointed one. Uh, Christ was not his last name. It's not like there was a mailbox in Nazareth that said the Christ family, and you had Joseph Christ, Mary Christ, and the baby, Jesus Christ. But Christ became such associated with the fullness of the anointing that Jesus received that many times we use it almost as like a, a last name, Jesus Christ. So if you have no questions on that point, then we can move to some of the questions. Uh, the, I would mention to Mary just the other day, it was just yesterday, wasn't it? I said, she said, how many questions did you get? And I said, I haven't gotten any. Um, but then I got a slew of questions. So I spent most of yesterday trying to put together some. I, actually, I did get one question at first was, um, the second one here, you were reading from a ref or referencing a book when you were talking to us this morning. I believe that you were looking for something, a homily from St. Francis. Can you share what that book is? And then I also got this other one here that go get goes back to a paragraph that we've already looked for at, but I, I just deal with that and then we can look at the second question. I keep going back to paragraph 393 that indirectly leads me to a question that I have been thinking about. So let me take a look at 393, just to refresh our memories here. It is the irrevocable character of their choice. Now this is calling the, uh, talking about the angels. It is the irre irrevocable character of their choice that they fell and not a defect in the infinite divine mercy that make the angels' sins unforgivable. There is no repentance for the angels after their fall, just as there is no repentance for men after death. So the question here, um, it makes perfect sense that an individual cannot influence God's judgment after the individual has died but to me, it raises a question about whether we, the living, through our prayers and devotions, can influence God's judgment after a loved one's death. My rationale is that perhaps the passage of time is a human construct rather than a divine construct. That's very true. Is it possible that God perpetually exists and acts in the present rather than in the past and future? Yes, to all of it. Yes, uh, God perpetually exists and acts in the present, but all of time is present at the very moment in God, past, present, and future. There is no time in God. God time is a, is a human construct, if you will. If that is possible, perhaps our prayers and devotions on behalf of our loved ones are not too late to influence God's judgment at their time of their death. 
does the church have a teaching on this? And the answer is, of course it does. <laughs> so let's take a look real quick at the teaching here. This, uh, we're going forward a little bit into a paragraph uh, 1030 and paragraph 1032. So we're kind of skipping ahead, but because we are dealing with uh, 393 and you know whether prayers after death mean anything, I thought it would be appropriate to look at these. And we will be hearing these again. I'm sure Father Mike will have something to say about them when we get to that point. This is in uh, 1030 and 1031. All who die in God's grace and friendship but still imperfectly purified are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after death, they undergo purification so as to reach, achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. The church gives the, same, the name purgatory to this final purification of the elect. Uh, before Murph tells me to get this straightened out, I'll get this straightened out here. Is that okay, Murph? He's here somewhere, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, this teaching is also based on the practice of prayer for the dead, already mentioned in sacred scripture. Therefore, Judas Maccabeus made atonement for the dead that they might be delivered from their sin. This was uh, when they, they had found some of the, the people who were involved with the Maccabean revolt, the, uh, the dead soldiers, and they were wearing amulets that uh, were Greek in, in nature, um, that, uh, that the whole revolt was against the Greek rule. So people were looking at that and saying, well, they, they died gloriously in battle, but they're wearing these amulets. So Judas said, well, let us make atonement for them so that it would not be held against them uh, when they stand before the Lord. From the beginning, the church has honored the memory of the dead and offered prayers and suffrage for them. Above all, the Eucharistic sacrifice, so that thus purified, they may attain the beatific vision of God. So the belief is that if you are choosing for the Lord at the moment of your death, and you've shown that by the way you've lived your life, that you're moving closer to the Lord, but there are still areas in your life that are not completely purified so that you're not completely subjected to the love and the will of God, then there's a period of, of time afterwards, a period of purgation or purification, purification, which is what purgatory is all about. It's like you're now in the antechamber before entering heaven, you have to take a good shower. You know, make sure that you're, you're, you're clean before you go before the throne of God. It's that, that kind of image. So in that sense, yes, we pray for those who have gone before us, uh, that the Lord will show mercy on them. So the prayers for the dead has been part of the, the faith for, from, for centuries, right from the beginning of Christianity. And actually, we pick it up from our Jewish brothers and sisters, as we see in the book of Maccabees. The other question was about the homily that I had mentioned. I couldn't find... Can I interrupt you? Oh, yes. Um, I think we have a bad way of looking at because the church's language. Judgment seems to be part of the Old Testament and acknowledgement part of the New Testament. So when we meet God, he's acknowledging our life choices. He's not sure. judging them. But I think if they change that language, it would be more understandable to Well, people. when I talk to the Pope later today, I will, <laughs> I will tell him. No, I agree. The, you know, the, ju the uh, judgment, basically, even when we stand before the Lord, at, you know, when we finally our, ourselves stand before the Lord, it's an acknowledgement of what we've chosen by our lives. So that we, in a sense, are judging ourselves. We choose. And when we stand before the Lord, that choice is accepted, if you will. So, yeah, I agree with I, I agree with Mary on that, with that one, so <laughs> write that down. It doesn't happen too often, so. Uh, the other question I had was on the, the book, uh, the, uh, what book I was using. I was looking for, if, this is Francis of Assisi, a saint, a collection of uh, St. Francis's writings. And I had mentioned that Francis had a very 
wonderful insight about how we are created. Again, Francis was not a theologian. And yet he had some wonderful insights to the theology that theologians afterwards really marvel at. He had just a, a very wonderful relationship with God. And the admonitions is a collection of, of little brief sayings of Francis from his homilies. Do you ever walk away from a homily that's gone on for like an hour? <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, at that time, the, the homilies were for an hour. But do you ever walk away from a homily and just remember one phrase? The one that, that really hits you? So there were a, a number of, of those phrases uh, or insights of Francis that people wrote down because they were really impressed by it. This is one of them. It's a, this is the fifth admonition. Consider, O human being, in what great excellence the Lord God has placed you. For he created and formed you to the image of his beloved son according to the body and to his likeness according to the spirit. So when, according to Francis, when God was creating humanity, he had his son in mind. We are made in the image of the son in our body. And according to his likeness, the Father, according to the Spirit. So it's a really quite a, an interesting way of, of looking at it. And I think it really does show for Francis, and this was something that's key, and you always have to keep in mind, Francis was living at a time that there was a very, very strong heresy afoot called the Cathars. And they were teaching that, I think I had mentioned this before, but I think it bears repeating, they were, they were teaching that there were two gods, God of uh, the Old Testament that is an evil God, and all matter comes from the evil God. And then the God of the New Testament is the good God. Now, everything spiritual comes from the good God. So people were saying at that time that the soul is entrapped in an evil body. The body is evil because it's matter, and it leads you to sin, and it's filled with temptation, and when you sin, it's, it's you know, you use your, your bodily appetites and your bodily desires and lustful thoughts and all this, so it is evil. So the idea for redemption is that the holy soul escapes the prison of the body. Now Francis is saying, your body is created in the image of God's beloved son. It is holy. Your body is holy. So this is a really wonderful insight uh, for, for Francis, but he, I think he's doing it very deliberately. It wasn't just something that he came to some, in some morning and thought it was a, an interesting uh, theological insight of his. This was something that he really strongly believed that we are holy in God's sight, both in our body and in our spirit, not simply in our spirit. So I love the way that he put that there. And I, 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 this is my favorite uh, picture of Francis. It was done by an artist in, in Assisi. It captures when Francis was embracing the leper. And he was saying, that even those who are leprous are holy. And he worked with lepers to the point where some doctors say he probably had the early signs of leprosy when he died because he spent so much time with the lepers. But you can see that real love that Francis had for the leper here. Okay, let's move on to another question. If I can get back to that. Does that make sense though, of Francis's approach to uh, the human person? Now, this was a, a very interesting question here that I think we could probably spend the next week looking at. <laughs> I certainly don't want to spend the next week looking at, but we can certainly discuss it. Both creation stories in Genesis and the related teachings are really great and instructive. Humans, Homo sapiens, have been around 300,000 years or so. Do you know if church theologians have studied human predecessors and their possible relationship to God in original sin? Neanderthals, just curious, 
couldn't find anything obvious on the internet. Um, there, just, so, just so you know, um, and something I think that many Catholics don't know, modern science is based on, on Catholic theologians. You go back to uh, Bacon and you know, back to the 13th century and even before, the Catholic Church laid the foundation for modern science. There has always been an interest in uh, science in, in the church. Uh, sometimes it's kind of a rocky dialogue that back and forth, but at other times it has been very fruitful and productive. If you would like to, you can just go to Google and type in Catholic Church and Science, and you'll find a, an awful lot. Even if uh, we go to Wikipedia, I think that's one of the first things that crops up is Wikipedia, and they go through the whole history of the development of science and the scientific methodology and the role that the church had in that. There's always a belief that has been for a long time, uh, the belief that truth is truth. And the truth that is arrived at by science is never in conflict with the truth of the church. Because if it's truth, it's truth. So we celebrate that. So one of the um, dialogues that have been going on is, well, how does the church deal with evolution, uh, the theory of evolution? To say, okay, it is a theory, first of all. It's a theory. It hasn't been uh, uh, de definitively proven, though it looks like there's an awful lot of proof to it. So what, how does the church deal with that? So this is from an article. Again, I hate or at one, one time, I should say, I really disliked Wiki, uh, Wikipedia because I think that it, it can fall short in many respects. But the article that they have on, on the church and evolution, I think, is, is very good. So if you, again, go to Google and type in Catholic Church and uh, evolution, I think the Wikipedia article comes up. And they, they do a very, very fine job. I'm not sure who is the author. Many times with Wikipedia, it's many authors that, that contribute to it. But they, it, I thought it was very, very well done. And they do quote Cardinal Ratzinger and uh, Pope um, Pius XII and uh, Pope Francis on this very issue. So I'd just like to read a couple of, of uh, quotes from first Cardinal Ratzinger and then Pope Francis. Now, this is uh, Cardinal Ratzinger. Uh, from 1995, and this is a book released in 2008, just uh, prior to his uh, rise to the papacy. He said, we cannot say creation or, ev or evolution in so much as these two things respond to two different realities. The story of the dust of the earth and the breath of God, which we just heard, referring to Genesis chapter 2, when God takes the dust, or actually the more, a better translation is the mud, the dirt of the earth, and blows in the breath of life. Uh, the story of the dust of the earth and the breath of God, which we just heard, does not, in fact, explain how human persons come to be, but rather what they are. It explains their inmost origin and cast light on the project that they are, and vice versa. The theory of evolution seeks to understand and describe biological developments. It's something to keep in mind, biological developments. But in so doing, it cannot explain where the project of human persons come from, nor their inner origin, nor their particular nature, what's inside. To that extent, we are faced with two complementary rather than mutually exclusive realities. So he's talking about the, the life of the spirit and the biological life. They are um, complementary rather than mutually exclusive. And in another uh, book that was released in, in 2008, he says this, the clay, and again, he's using that more accurate translation from Genesis 2, the clay became man at the moment in which a being for the first time was capable of forming, however dimly, the thought of God. 
the first thou that however stammeringly uh, through the uh, unfinished way of expression was said by human lips to God marks the moment in which the spirit arose in the world. Here the Rubicon of anthropogenesis, let's see, the beginning of human beings, human life, if you will, um, was crossed. For it is not the use of weapons or fire, not new methods of cruelty or of useful activity that constitute man, but his ability to be immediately in relation to God. This holds fast to the doctrine of the special creation of man. Herein lies the reason why the moment of anthropogenesis cannot possibly be determined by paleontology. Anthropogenesis is the rise of the spirit, which cannot be excavated with a shovel. The theory of evolution does not invalidate the faith, nor does it uh, corroborate it. But it does challenge the faith to understand itself more profoundly, and thus to help man to understand himself and to become increasingly what he is, the being who is supposed to say, thou to God in eternity. Do you follow that? Uh, I, you didn't follow that. OK, let me, let me uh, back up then. He's, he's talking again about the, the physical and the spiritual. And he's saying the science can really delve into the physical and can talk, about, can talk about the development of the physical nature of a human being. But a human being only becomes a human being with the introduction of the spirit of God. The moment that that human being recognizes that he or she is in relationship to God and can say thou. And he's using this very specifically. And I'm, I'm sure he's not writing in English. So this is either in, in German or in Italian. Um, but he was very good in English as well. His English was, even though he spoke with a very strong German accent, his English was actually very good. Thou, we see that, you, we use that in our prayer as well. It's a, it's a much more formal, reverent way of re referring to somebody, of, of giving honor. So this is a moment that he said a human, that human or that, that uh, person who looks like a person, if you will, physically, becomes a human being with the introduction of the spiritual, the introduction of a soul. And then at that moment, he or she is able to be in that intimate relationship with God in which he can say thou to God, okay? So again, he said, that if you take a look at evolution, again, the church's position was, fine, if evolution is proven, that that just shows how God created. So that there is no uh, contradiction uh, to the, the Catholic faith if evolution would be proven. Because then they say, well, fine, that's the way God created. So the, the church would be against a, an atheistic evolution. That evolution just happened because of you know, a mixed smash of, of molecules that evolved from one form of life to another form of life to another form of life and God didn't have anything to say about it. No, it's God was involved at every step of that at evolution, and the, way, the reason that, that humans evolved was that God gave the ability for that evolution to take place. But somewhere along the line, there was the introduction of the soul. When the, that being got to a particular point of maturation, if you will, of, of the intellect. Then there was the introduction of the soul, and that's when human life, human life, begins with the introduction of, of the soul. So that's basically what the, the Pope is trying to point out here. Pope Francis then sort of picked up on this. This is in October uh, 2014, and he's, uh, addressing the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. Um, there is a Pontifical 
uh, council of scientists that are made up of, of lay men and women and, and priests, many times Jesuits, because the Jesuits tend to get involved with this. Um, they, they continue the, the study of science with the understanding that any truth that science expresses is a truth of the faith as well, because all truth comes from God, who is the source of truth. So he's saying this is October 2014. Evolution in nature is not inconsistent with the notion of creation. Warning against thinking of God's act of creation as God being a ma magician with a magic wand. The Pope this expressed it in this statement. God created hum beings and allowed them to develop according to the internal law that he gave to each one so that they were able to develop and to arrive at their fullness of being. He gave autonomy to the beings of the universe at the same time at which he assured them of his continuing presence, giving being to every reality. And so creation continued for centuries and centuries, millennia and millennia, until it became what we know today, precisely because God is not a magician but the creator who gives being to all things. The Big Bang, which nowadays is posited as the origin of the world, does not contradict the divine act of creating, but rather requires it. The evolution of nature does not contrast with the notion of creation, as evolution presupposes the creation of beings that evolve. Again, God is not a magician, but the creator who brought everything to life. Evolution in nature is not inconsistent with the notion of creation because evolution requires the creation of beings that evolve. And we see that uh, not expressed specifically like that in the catechism, but we've seen this before in you know, Article 159, where uh, the catechism deals with faith and science. Methodological research in all branches of, of knowledge, provided it is carried out in a truly scientific manner and does not override moral laws, can, can never conflict with faith because the things of the world and the things of faith derive from the same God. The humble and persevering investigator of the secrets of nature is being led, as it were, by the hand of God in spite of himself, for it is God, the conserver of all things who made them what they are. Does that, that help? Uh, I think Mary and I were talking about this the other day as well. You know, what does this mean for Adam and Eve? And we're saying that, that everything flows from the, uh, the mother and father of all human life. Well, in this sense then, when the evolution got to the point where the uh, the being was able to receive or did receive the soul, then you have the first couple there. And then after that, we can still say, and there's so, you know, it's say, well, what is the Catholic position on, on anything? You can see that our church is so vast that you're going to find the Catholic position presented in a number of ways. And there are some scientists who are Catholic scientists who are saying, yes, you can make a case for Adam and Eve, that there was a, a time God got to a point through, if, if evolution is proven, got to a point where these beings were ensouled, God created the soul for them, then you have the first couple at that point. Um, and then you have other scientists who are saying, well, Adam and Eve, even in this point, can be just uh, stand-ins for the human person. And there could have been more than one Adam and more than one Eve at a particular time. But somewhere along the line in the process of evolution, there was that invitation by God for relationship and the giving of, of a soul. And then the human person, as both uh, Pope <coughs> Uh, Benedict and Pope uh, Francis point out, then the, home, the person actually becomes a human person. So, you know, going back to some of the uh, ancient kind of or medieval understandings, well, what is a human person? A human person is someone who, with intellect and will. 
um, the church's position is it's not enough to have intellect and will. It's got to be intellect, will, and a transcendent dimension or the, the divine soul. Uh, going back to, to Francis, that soul is made in the image and likeness of, of, of God. I hope I didn't get too far afield there with that. Does that make sense to people? So again, uh, if, if uh, this, this truth that, that's displayed by, by science, it comes from the author of truth. I think that's the bottom line there. I was talking to somebody fairly recently about this because they, I don't know if she's here today, but she had grown up in a uh, fundamentalist uh, church, said, well, uh, you know, if we follow the, the biblical uh, stories as if they were scientific fact, then human life only goes back, what, 5,000 years or something. So, uh, you know, what are these, you know, the, this whole idea of dinosaurs and, and uh, you know, beings and so forth that go way, way back in history. Um, most fundamentalist churches would say that that is not true. Uh, the Catholic Church's position is, you know, if there are dinosaurs, wow, isn't that great? Look at the, <laughs> the, the creative, you know, force of God, you know, that he created dinosaurs? And the God who created dinosaurs, a T-Rex, <laughs> created me? Wow, that's great. <laughs> that, that would be a different uh, perspective on that. Uh, the other thing is I, w I was thinking about, it. I thought of a joke that I had heard many years ago, and like I said, I hope I don't forget the uh, punchline of this. But there's this uh, young girl who was angry with her parents. I, don't, I hate to break this to you, but sometimes young girls get angry with their parents. And she came to her mother and said, one of you is lying. She said, what do you mean one of us are lying? I went to daddy and asked him where I came from. And he told me that we came from apes. And then I came to you and I asked you where we came from and you said we came from God. So one of you is lying. Mm -hmm. And she said, dear, neither one of us is lying. I, I, I told you about my side of the family. He told you about <laughs> his side of the family. <laughs> I always appreciated that, Derek. Anyway. <laughs> okay, since we have a little time, I wanted to uh, just sort of conclude a little bit with a, a, a further understanding of original sin, if we can sort of go back, not that I want to steep us in sin again. But uh, uh, the other day when I was doing some research on this, I, I ran across a, a, um, a, a YouTube video from Bishop Barron. Uh, and I think he has some, some very good things to say about this piece. This, hopefully the sound will work on this. Now this, this is from, you, you know Bishop Barron, right? He has a word on fire ministry. Apparently, this is being translated to another language as well, so there's the subtext here. I don't know what language this would be. It almost looks like it's Dutch or something. But uh, ignore the subtitles. Bar left. If you turn the computer up, but not the video itself, in the bottom left corner, the mic. Uh, it, it's the wrong one. I'll, I'll play it. It's the wrong one. Uh, Thank you. 
I really did appreciate his, his view on that because I think that's, you know, you say, well, what is the original sin? It wasn't just that they did something that God didn't tell them to do, but they were trying to hold on to themselves what is only of the Lord, what is only of God. That we become the center instead of God becoming the center of, of life. I think that's a good way, good point to, to stop. And then we'll continue uh, this next week exploring the second person of the Holy Trinity, uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we've looked at Jesus, we'll look at Christ, the next is the Lord, and then the implications of that. So I'm really, really quite interested and excited to see where we're going with all of that. So again, thank you all very much. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thanks again, everyone. Appreciate it.